This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay. Hello again. <laughs> um, oh, where to start? I'm, I'm in the sort of tired zone now because I said I've been doing talk after talk for two months, and now I've got. Well, as of, as of next week, I've got two months off to write a book, which is nice. Um, it was a horrible thing called Christmas in the way, but don't worry about that. Um, yeah, um, I, I had a talk I did for about two to three years called uh, Jam Tomorrow, which was, I, I knew I had to do a talk about fracking. This was back in 2010. And I was walking for a day on Beckley, Beckley Common near Oxford, looking down across Ockmore, which is of course where Lewis Carroll was inspired to write Alice Through the Looking Glass because of the pattern of the fields, looking like a chessboard. And I said, ah, yeah, jam, jam tomorrow, because that in a way is what a lot of all the stuff that they're talking about shower gas is, it's jam tomorrow, it's a, a tomorrow which will never ever arrive. And people running faster and faster to, to stand still. Um, I had the, I, I got an email back in 2008 from a, from a friend in America saying, you really should look at Frankie. And then we had the crash, and then the talk I had been doing, and all the work I had been doing, sort of stopped, because after the crash, nobody wanted to talk about why it happened, which is weird. <coughs> and so, in 2009, I started seriously looking at fracking. In 2010, the government brought out its consultation on, this is where we'd like to do it, and I started going around the country. And one of the first places I started doing talks was in Lancashire. And at that time, I thought fracking was absolutely wonderful, because in my work as an environmental consultant with campaign groups the last 20 years, I'd worked on landfills and toxicology and air pollution and geophysics and contaminated land, environmental chemistry, toxicology. And fracking has it all in one subject. You could teach the entire basis of environmental campaigning from fracking because it includes every possible environmental issue you could think about, from, from global warming to land use. And so for the last four years, I've been doing that. But over the last year, after... So I did a talk here last December? Or mm -hmm. November? Last yeah. November, wasn't it? Uh, at the end of my last autumn tour. And I'm here at the end of this autumn tour. Um, but I almost gave up at the end of last year, because... I realised that all that experience was completely useless because they weren't interested in the facts. They had assumptions, they had beliefs about what this would do for us and that is all they wanted to hear. And it's very strange that we, we work in a... Um, it's partly why I did the talk earlier today as I did because we work in a system where we believe that we work in a rational framework of explanations and evidence and open and transparent decisions made on the basis of evidence, and we don't. And fracking's really interesting because this, more than any other, more than GM, and I did a lot of work on GM, more than nuclear, and I've done lots of work on nuclear, this issue is complete and utter bunkum. There is no evidence to support an awful lot of what is in the media about fracking. Um, I start here. Um, I'm sure, I think Damien's got the address. I, I have a, on my website, I have what I call my walking journal. And I take lots of pretty pictures when I, when I go on walks. And uh, they seem to be working their way into my presentations more. Uh, this is Sandy Lane. It's on the border of Oxfordshire and Northamptonshire. And down the lane there is the boundary of the area they're currently offering under the 14th round for a fracking licence. Um, and it's strange, you sort of walk up this way from Banbury, and wherever you go from here on, they could be fracking. And it's quite nice you can walk to Bicester or over Ackley, but uh, it, it always says fracking to me now whenever I walk up that lane. <laughs> anyway, um, this is just a quick trawl through the media. And for many years, I've always avoided the media, because a lot of the work I did was with councils. And if I'm going to a council and I want to fill it their file system, their public registers for information. I don't want them to know who I am because I try and hide stuff. And what's strange is that with this issue, even though I've tried to get to the media more, they don't want to know. For some reason, uh, the media has a complete disconnect on this subject. 
they want to look at their interpretation of it. They want to look at earthquakes. They want to look at protesters jumping up and down. They don't want to look at health. They don't want to look at air pollution. They don't want to look at the, the digging up of the countryside for trenches or pipelines. There's a whole lot of things about fracking and coal bed methane that we know from experience in Australia and America, which go far wider than the environmental impacts you see in the media, which the media just don't want to know about. And, and in fact, generally, when you trawl through the media, it's the mainstream media is on the whole quite positive. Um, I have a friend who, who freelances for all the newspapers, and she was freelancing at The Guardian for a couple of weeks and tapped me up for a story. So I sort of go through her story. It wasn't in any way extreme, it was balanced, evidence for and against iGas's new license in Manchester. And she, said, and she sent the story in, and when it came out, it was actually published, it, the whole sense of it had been completely switched to be pro. Instead of questioning the com company's figures, because, well, hang on, if you look at what they have to report to the stock exchange, it couldn't possibly be that. They just reported that, oh, they found all this gas. And none, none of the testing of the evidence was in the final article. And that generally is how you see stuff in the media. The, the facts, even though they're very basic, are never tested. And so, yeah, Energy Minister Michael Fallon urges support for new shale gas wells, and we can expect 40 wells, is what he's saying. Well, in Quadri Quadrilla's plan for Lancashire is 3,000. And if you look, if you tot up all the different options for the country, we're looking at anything up to 50,000. In America, they're drilling 50,000 per year. And so, this idea that we're going to have 40. That might be exploration wells, but that's not the final figure. Although he was talking about it as if it was the final figure. Uh, my favourite, UKIP. Anti-fracking eco-freaks will kill economic opportunity. Well, that assumes it will bring e economic opportunities. And this is the thing, it's all generally positive and the evidence isn't tested. Now, that's, that's the mainstream media. I, uh, I spend what is an unfortunate amount of time reading the trade media and science journals. And there... It's a very different story. Uh, fi finance journals especially, um, they are all extremely sceptical at the moment. Because in America, they are losing money. Um, Shell has just walked out of shale gas in America having lost $2 billion. BHP Billiton, they've lost $2.8 billion. If you tot it up, the reports, uh, last year's company returns and the ones they've announced so far this year, in the last 18 months, They've lost about $30 billion on shale gas investments in America. Now, if a bank lost $2 billion, it would be in the news. They would be, oh, let's have an inquiry into this bank as to how they suddenly lost $2 billion. But apart from the trade press, there was no coverage of the shell losing $2 billion. And again, it's sort of, it, it's there, but you really have to look for, the, for these alternative views on it. And this is a problem we have, that the media have become repeaters, not reporters. And the idea that the media is there to test on behalf of the public any evidence put forward into the public arena, this is a very quaint notion, but they don't do it anymore. Which, if the government is not taking arguments, they're just going ahead of it. And if the media is not taking arguments, they're just going ahead of it. Where does that leave the public? How do they test? How do they challenge? the information that's out there, which is so obviously, by reference to studies done in Australia particularly, but also more and more studies being done in America, how do they challenge this idea that this is all hunky-dory and it's going to make us all rich? Um, I, I did this a few months ago, but uh, two weeks ago, Lord Brown gave a speech. And even Lord Brown says that shale gas will not bring down the price of gas in Britain. And so that's the government's in man on energy. He's a, he's a non-executive director at the cabinet office. And if he doesn't believe it's going to make a difference... Anyway, um, the government at the moment are in organising mode. Uh, I used to do a lot of work on incinerators. And the last round of incinerators that came round, which was 2008, um, I didn't do it that time. I'd done the previous three pushes for incinerators. I didn't do that one because when Labour was in, they changed all the laws and all the guidelines so that incinerators could just sail straight through the system without being able to oppose them. And we've now got permissions for 30 incinerators, lots of them are being built, it could be in the stage in a year or so's time, 
when there more, there's more incinerator capacity in Britain than waste to burn. Which is interesting because Sweden is in exactly the same position and we're exporting waste from Britain to Sweden to burn in their incinerators because otherwise they default in their contracts. So at the moment the government is consulting or putting out reports and there's been a few reports in the last uh, few months. Beginning of September we had potential greenhouse gas emissions associated with shale gas extraction and use. And I read this on the train going down, down to Brighton for the Green Party conference. And as I read it, I just thought, this is, this is wrong. There's a whole lot of stuff in here that's missing. And they kept talking about appendices A, B, and C. But in the report, there's only appendix A. There was no appendix B or C. So when I got home, beginning of September, I wrote to DEC and I said, OK, I want, I want the appendices, please. And because they have to reply in 15 days, 15 days later, they sent me a corrupted file which didn't read as anything. So I got back to them, sorry, this, isn't, this doesn't work on the appendices. And so at the beginning of October, they finally sent me the whole report, which I then also had to release on their website, with the appendices that were missing. And their whole verdict was, you know, in the absence of information about the quality of UK share gas, we assume that share gas will produce similar emissions to the process of the conventional gas. So this, this report, which is the government's definitive statement on shale gas will not add to our greenhouse gas emissions. The only evidence they can offer, I mean, this is pretty much the guts of Appendix B, is just, well, we assume this. There's no reference to studies. They, they refer to a study which hadn't yet been completed, which is being carried out by the University of Texas, which, as we say, in America last year, they drilled 50,000 gas wells. And they sampled 127, which the industry told them to go to. So it was a non-randomised sample. And on the basis of that 127 non-randomised, they said, oh, it's a fraction. All those, well, they, they look at one study, which uh, comes out and says that it's much higher. And they called that an outlier. Now, the point about outliers and data is, yeah, there is one figure that's off over there. But we now have five separate studies by three universities and two government departments, which all come into much the same position as what they call an outlier. And that was not tackled at all in the report, they just ignored it and carried on. So you have to say, well, hang on, um, the government, I mean, the minister got up there and gave this press conference, and he was basically talking assumption, but he was talking about assumption as if it was definite. So anyway, uh, I contacted all my chums in the media, of course, a month later, they weren't interested in doing a story because it's now a dead media story because it's a month old. And so nothing happened about it. And a couple of weeks later, we had this report. Review of potential public health impacts of exposures to chemical and radioactive pollutants as a result of shale gas extraction. Um, now, I've, been, I've got friends in America and in Australia. And in and both those countries now, they're now getting reports coming out. They've had 10 years of experience. They are now getting proper health studies of areas subject to these, these types of operation and the health effects which are showing up. Different countries, different technology, America's mostly fracking, Australia's mostly coal bed methane, you're getting very similar types of public health impact. Headaches, nosebleeds, nausea, mood problems, skin rashes, uh, allergies, all sorts of things. Um, and this basically said, uh, Currently available evidence indicate that potential risks to public health from exposure to the emissions associated with shale gas extraction are low if operations are properly run and regulated. That's a truism. If it's properly run and regulated, it's all okay. Well, there's absolutely, um, and again, this provided no evidence. Now, it says here, draft for comment. Now, there's no information in here about what the consultation process is and where you should write to. But they actually said in the press release, if anybody has any evidence, we'd like to see it. So they didn't look for it. There are now plenty of things out there on this. But they cited no studies to support this. They did not investigate any of the studies which put the opposite point of view. So again, no basic research. But more interestingly, because this draft will comment, I went to the, health, the Public Health England's website to try and find out the consultation. And there was no mention of the consultation in the Public Health England website. And then I dug some more and found that this report is not on the Public Health England website. Now, I've had a letter with the Chief Executive of Public Health England, which I still haven't had a reply to a month later, because I've been told that this isn't a Public Health England report. It's been drafted by outside consultants. 
The reason it's not on their website is that they won't put it on their website. It's on the old Health Protection Agency website, which closed down in March. It's on an archive website. And nobody's spotted this. Nobody's sussed that, hang on, this isn't an official report. So um, now I'm home. Next week I'm going to chase the executive, chief executive of Public Health England because at the moment this report doesn't even seem to exist. But it's being quoted as if it was an official Public Health England report. So that's what's happening over here. If we go to the rest of the world, they are way ahead of us. Um, this is the chief medical officer of New Brunswick's report. Uh, about the impacts that may happen there. New Brunswick in Canada, uh, they just started doing fracking there. And the public demanded, and were able to get because of the Canadian political system, an official report by the Chief Medical Officer as to what the impacts might be. And it wasn't, it's a very balanced report, it, it actually looks at evidence and looks at experience elsewhere. But it came back and said, there are significant data gaps that limit the ability to thoroughly assess the risks of public health and little information on cumulative or full life cycle effects. So it basically said, well, yes, there are health impacts, but in the conclusion, basically, we don't know what it's going to be because nobody else has studied this properly. So it's admitting there are effects, but we haven't got the first clue what they will be because nobody's done that kind of baseline research. Um, this report goes on to say what we have to have is baseline studies of communities before it happens, during development, after development, in order to deduce what the effect will be. And that's hopefully what they're going to do there. Um, that was September 2012. November 2012, UNEP, United Nations Environment Programme, they brought out their global synopsis of the evidence of uh, the impact of fracking. And their basic point was, uh, hydrological fracking may result in unavoidable environmental impacts, even if gas is extracted properly and more so if done inadequately. Even if risk can be reduced theoretically, in practice there may be accidents from leaky or malfunctioning equipment, as well as from bad practice, which are regularly occurring. So their review, which looked at global experience, not just in America, but Australia and a few other countries that are doing this, was that environmental pollution is bound to happen, because that's what's happened elsewhere. That's our experience. And this really is, is the problem I have. I have 20 years working on all these different projects, all these different environmental pollution issues, and it suddenly seems experience is worthless. Being able to draw on studies elsewhere doesn't matter because what the government are doing is they're looking for people who will say what they want to say and then using them to promote their points of view. Any questions, Bob, by the way? We're going to move on. Right. Um, oh, don't you just love geological maps? I'm, I'm sure geologists take way too many drugs. <laughs> um, ge uh, unconventional resources. Now, at the moment, we're talking about unconventional gas, unconventional oil. It is possible that in the future, they might try and do various forms of metal production. So in, in Canada, uh, particularly associated with uranium mining, they've got this new process called in-situ leaching, where you drill holes in the ground, you set up explosives to fracture the igneous rock, and then you inject extremely strong acid, and then you leave it for three or four years, and then suck out the liquor to get all the metals. And this was going to be the new future of mining. Uh, particularly at Cigar Lake, uh, there's going to be a big new uranium mine to solve the world's uranium problems by extracting lots of uranium. Trouble was, they've only got two-fifths of the acid back. Most of it has gone into the environment, and uh, if that then migrates into the environment, you've got metal-rich leachate making its way around. And people are seriously proposing um, acid, uh, acid leaching for all sorts of things now. Um, one of the ways they might do acid leaching is in tailings. So if you've got an old lead mine, they might start acid leaching the lead tailings uh, uh, to try and get more lead, but also <laughs> gold and all sorts of things there. Um, so I'm, to I, I'm more and more I'm using the term unconventional resources <coughs> because we're talking about fracking for gas <coughs> and for oil. But really, there is a bigger move out there for all types of unconventional extraction for other metals particularly, because the prices now justify that. Even though the returns are much lower, the price is now so high, it makes it worthwhile. Anyway, 
oil and gas. Down here, the rocks are far too young to hold any significant oil and gas. What, what oil and gas is there along the weald? That's there because it's leaked uphill from the deposits in the English Channel. Which is interesting at Balkan because all the coverage of Balkan was about fracking for gas in shale. Well, Balkan was sandstone, they weren't fracking, and it was oil. So apart from that, Balkan was a really good protest. <laughs> um, and it's weird that I'm now being asked to be a, um, to represent some of the, the people in court. And it is difficult because they are being dumb for what they hadn't really understood was happening when they got done. Which, which brings a whole new, new twist to it. Anyway, down here, too young. Because to make oil and gas, you have to take organic matter, you have to bury it and bury it. And the deeper you bury it, the temperature goes up, the pressure goes up. And you end up with stuff called kerogen, which is, if you don't clean your oven very often, that's the stuff you get in the bottom. It's very similar. And, but if you keep burying it, you bury it deeper, you increase the pressure and the temperature. Then you get oil. And if you bury it deeper still, you get gas. When you get down to three or four kilometres, the temperature and pressure will turn into gas. Keep burying it even further, or get it hotter, it will turn into graphite. But, um, so if you bury it to about three or four kilometres, leave it for 100 million years, and then get tectonic processes to bring it back to the surface, then it's usable oil and gas. So up here, this is 600 million years old. This is too old to have any oil and gas because there's not enough organic matter in the environment at that time to create it. So where we're looking is somewhere between there and there. But then there's other exclusions. Down here, too volcanic, too volcanic, wrong era, wrong geology. So there's a sort of swathe through the middle of England and then the central belt of Scotland where either because of coal or because of gas, uh, rocks containing oil and gas, that they can use these new techniques to try and get the, the stuff out of the ground. Three different technologies. And again, the media have problems with this concept. Um, <laughs> fracking is not always fracking. Sometimes they don't do fracking at all. Um, shale gas is gas from shale. It sort of does what it says in the tin. Um, black shale, shale which contains a lot of organic matter. It's like clay that's had organic matter mixed in, compressed, heated, it produces oil and gas, but like clay, the stuff can't move because it's so fine-grained, it's trapped there. Unlike sandstone or limestone when this happens, where it can migrate and form a reservoir, it just can't move. So you go in, you fracture the rock, flushing chemicals, and out comes the oil and gas. There are various places we can do that in Britain, but possibly the thing they will go most overboard on is coal bed methane. Because there are a lot of, there's a lot of deep coal in Britain that hasn't been worked. And it's very, it, this is like fracking in coal seams, except sometimes this is an awful lot of coal, uh, gas in the coal seam. You don't need to frack it. You just need to shatter the rock with explosives and the gas will come out. Um, that has got a lot of bad press in America. Australia has more coal bed methane experience than fracking. And some of the evidence suggests that coal bed methane is worse. Um, has anybody got a jug filter in their kitchen to filter the tap water? Mm. Right. That is basically a, a, a little slug of carbon, activated carbon, that you pour water through, and the carbon, because of its structure, mops up any pollutants, chlorine, whatever in the water, so it tastes nicer. That's what a coal seam is, it's a big slab of carbon. And so over millions of years, as groundwater percolates through the coal seam, it takes out any pollutants in the groundwater. And so relatively, coal seams contain more pollutants, particularly sulphides, heavy metals, than shales, because they've collected it over their over geological history. And so this seems to produce more environmental toxins than, than shale gas. But unfortunately, the media don't get this. They tend to call it all fracking, even though it's not. And this one barely gets mentioned in the media, even though there's quite a few sites where they want to do it now. Underground coal gasification. I'm, I'm going to go through all these in detail. I'm just outlining them so you, you understand the difference. This is what I call the nuclear option, because you drill down and you set fire to the coal seams. And it's really interesting, because in the north of Warwickshire, Dormill Colliery has been on fire for more than a year. And the company's gone bankrupt, pretty much, and they want the government to give them £60 million to inject nitrogen to put the fire out. 
and the government won't give them money. Whereas 20 miles down the road in South Warwickshire, they are just applying for a license in the coal authority to set fire to the coal seams. And it is, it is bizarre, I, I'll talk about this later, but it is an absurd idea, but people will still put the money in. And the reason generally these technologies have come up is we are running out of conventional oil and gas. And as prices go up, the potential returns, even on these very dodgy processes, is high enough that people who are in, into high-risk investment will put their money in. And it is large global investment houses who can afford to lose a few tens of billions here, a few tens of millions there, who are willing to put the money in, because potentially if it were, they'd make ten times that figure. And this literally is how they do it. They're looking at a percentage margin. As long as so many pay off, then it will, it will work. Where it went wrong in America with shale gas was they had this theory called the hom homogeneous theory that they did a few holes in the best places in the Barnet Shale in, in around 2000 and they flowed gas. And people then invested in shale gas in America as if every hole would produce that. And what they discovered is that shale isn't homogeneous, it's anything but. You can have two holes half a mile apart and one will pour gas and one won't. One will pour gas and a lot of sulphides and uh, uranium, the other one won't. So that's why they've lost money in America. They invested on the basis that everyone would produce a lot of gas and it didn't. In Britain, unlike America, uh, we've nationalised the minerals rights. Back in 1934, the government decided we're going to nationalise all the minerals rights, then we'll have control and we'll be able to dig all this stuff up. Except for baronial landlords, the aristocracy who had inherited their titles in effect from William the Conqueror. Because in order to get this through the House of Lords at the time, they had to give them special treatment. So although the government licenses mineral rights, um, over here in Hertfordshire, I think Lord Salisbury has written to everybody around Watford basically saying, I own the rights under your house and I want to frack it. Mm. Uh, the Duke of Westminster has just registered the rights for East Lancashire. Now, the orange areas, they've already been licensed. Most of these are for conventional oil and gas. Um, up here near Pickering, there's a conventional gas well. One gas well produces as much gas as a hundred shale gas wells. And that pretty much sums up the difference between conventional gas and unconventional gas. Conventional resources are free flowing. Because they're free flowing, one well will perform huge amounts of service. Unconventional gas, you need lots of wells, you need lots of chemicals in order to get the stuff to flow. <coughs> These areas, off in the west, particularly South Wales, they were issued in 2008 under the 13th round, and these are primarily for fracking and coal bed methane, shale gas and coal bed methane. The green area is the bit they were offering in 2010, which in total is about 60% of England. Um, I say offering because they offered it in 2010. I did the, the court case for the protesters in, in Preston in 2012. And after that, they have gone through point by point and tried to close all the little loopholes. One of which is they're supposed to be issuing a new strategic environmental appraisal for this whole process. Because the last one was awful. I mean, they were saying 800 wells for the entire country, even though they planned 3,000 just in that square there. So they're trying to retroactively plug the gaps. And they, they were supposed to be announcing the results last month, and they didn't. So either they're going to announce it just before Christmas, so that nobody notices, which is a possibility, or we'll have to announce it next year. And at the moment, all these companies are champing at the bit to get on and do it. In addition, this is for coal methane shale gas. Um, these little red triangles around the coast, that's underground coal gasification. And those licenses are issued by the Coal Authority. And they have no environmental information whatsoever. You basically go along to the Coal Authority, say, I want to do this here. You'd have to provide no environmental case that this will be okay. They just <laughs> issue you the license if you pay the fee. And at the moment, there's 24. They're all on the coast. The idea being, if it goes wrong, the pollution will end up in the sea. The trouble is that working on the coast is quite expensive. So 
In September, we had Britain's first onshore application for gasification just there in Warwickshire. Um, we'll come back to that. Any questions on that before we move on? My mapping skills aren't brilliant. That one that looks like it's near Essex. <laughs> do you know what, for, for the red, the triangle? Oh, that, yeah. Do you know where that is? I was interested. It's, it's off uh, Mapping Sands. Is that where, where is it? It's not like South End or somewhere like that, is it? Where's, it's yeah. a bit beyond there, yeah. It's up, up the coast more. Oh, okay. Yeah. Have they struck? Um, I think, who was the company? What? A lot of the companies who've got these have since gone defunct because they invested in, in this about three or four years ago. Um, and since then, not a lot has happened. So the one down here in Swansea Bay, that was a company called Clean Coal UCG. And they were tying carbon capture and storage to underground gasification. But now carbon capture and storage has fallen through, which is the main part of their business case to sell the technology elsewhere for that. Their gasification has fallen through as well. Uh, the one there in the latter estuary and the one, two up here in the first and fourth, that's a company called Clough Coal, Clough, Clough Natural Resources. And they really are, they're serious. And not only are they serious, the bloke behind it, Algie Clough, is... Does anybody remember the Long, Long Row um, kerfuffle in the 70s? Long Row was a, a, a oh, company yes. that had lots of dealings in Africa. Yeah. And after all the fuss in the 70s, um, they went off to Africa and stayed there. And they're into mining. <laughs> And Algie Clough ran the operations in South Africa, and he sold up just a few weeks before the company shot its workers, if you remember that. Um, but he's come back to Britain, and for a time project, he wants to save Britain by setting fire to the coal seams. Have any of these started? Uh, I'll come back to that. <laughs> okay, shale gas. As I said, it's specific types of rock you can use for this. Now, the oldest rocks that you can do this in are about 400 million years old, uh, Tremadoc shales. They outcrop in, in the Snowdonia National Park and the Pembrokeshire National Park, but they're deep down, a few kilometres down, and the most of southern Wales and across into southern England. And that's the basement for fracking. S slightly less old, uh, the Morian shale, the, Bo the Bowen shale as it's called. Uh, that's about 330 odd million years old, and that underlies most of the north of England. It outcrops on top of the Pennines, but because of the geological faults that run up and down the country, it's buried either side. And that's a pretty good prospect. It's, it's just about the right age. Like, like a good wine, you have to age hydrocarbons before they, they're just right. And that's probably the best bet for shale gas in Britain. A less good bet, but which might work, is the Liassic, this is the, the bottom of the Jurassic era, about 200, well, 180, 200 million years old. And that runs from sort of uh, Dorset up through the country to North Yorkshire. <coughs> and quite a few bits of this have been licensed. It's not as good as the stuff up here, but it's possible. And these are the areas that they're, they're interested in at the moment. Um, if I go back to this map, this one here, uh, as I said, back in 2010, I started travelling mostly to Lancashire, because it hadn't started in Lancashire, but I went up there. I worked with a lot of groups in Lancashire on toxic waste landfills and incinerators and other jolly things like that. And so I used my old contacts to start having meetings up there. And some of the groups up in Lancashire, I think they might have started after I went. A bit, a bit like when my, my book, Energy Beyond All, I was going around talking about peak oil back in 2004, 2005. A lot of transition groups started up. I was one of the speakers at one of the early transition top nest meetings. And uh, so I, I've been going Lancashire 2010, 2011. I'm now traveling in other areas. And this is, this is actually my patch. I live in Banbury. And I've been traveling around the South Midlands because this is one of the areas that you might want to start doing it next. I have a, a friend in the county council. And Oxfordshire County Council has definitely been approached from a developer, they won't tell me who, about what would happen if they put an application for this box here. They haven't got the license yet, but if they're talking to the county council, they obviously have interests. And the reason they're interested in this box is that so the end of Persian oil company drilled a well there in 1956 and it poured gas because there's a, a geological anomaly in the middle of that box that has created a very gas rich rock. But this whole area over here, which runs right down into the Cotswolds, that's another possibility, although this is probably the richest one. 
And of course, oh, we haven't got there yet. We'll do gasification, underground gasification later. So the South Midlands is one of the areas. We'll, we'll look at the other areas in a moment. Um, has anybody seen that diagram? I hate it. Most of the impacts of fracking, shale gas, are not in the well. I, I, if I weren't so tired, I would jump up and down and say this. Most of the impacts are not in the well. Um, when you pump stuff out of a well, because you're creating a, a negative pressure, most of the force goes inwards. So stuff tends not to leak outwards. In America, most of the problems they've come up with over the, over the years have been when they get rid of all their pollutants by pumping them deep underground, which is called disposal, deep, deep geologic disposal. So if you have a well like this and you force all the water down, then yes, you'll push it all over the place. Um, but most of the impacts of these wells isn't so much the well, it's all that goes on at ground level. Because every well is linked together to its compressor station by a pipeline. So if you're digging lots of pipelines across the country, you're going through hedgerows, you're going through watercourses, there's all sorts of opportunities to cause environmental damage. Then you get to the compressor station. At the compressor station, 80 to 100 wells connect up, and all the pollutants in the gas are stripped out. And what do you do with that pollution? Well, mostly, most of the gaseous stuff is released to air. And in America and in Australia, a lot of the health impacts that have been observed have been around compressor stations. Now, nobody talks about compressor stations. They always talk about this, which I find really annoying. Then, when you've got all this waste, the solid waste and liquid waste, what do you do with that? Um, I had somebody I know up in the Environment Agency in Lancashire, and two wells have been fracked in Lancashire. And all the waste in those wells was sent to David Hume Sewage Works near Manchester, which is the biggest sewage works in Europe. And two wells produce too much pollution for that waste to be taken there anymore. So what's holding Quadrilla up in Lancashire now is they have to find somewhere else to get rid of their waste, and they're probably going to do deep disposal, which means drilling another well somewhere else and re-injecting it. But the types of stuff they get from that, if you were to drill down and you were to tap a vein of rock which happened to have a lot of uranium and thorium in, then the liquid that comes out contains an awful lot of what is called naturally occurring radioactive materials. Now this could be radioactive to an intermediate level. And again I've been told by a friend up there that there are some drums of sludge from one of the, the wells in Lancashire that are still arguing, you know, is the sludge mineral waste or radioactive waste? Because if it's radioactive waste, it's quite a lot more expensive to get rid of. And so they're going ahead with this without actually working out all the regulatory hurdles first. But yeah, the, the noise, the pollution emissions, disturbance, there are so many different ways in which this affects the environment. But they're ignored because they're all the media are just focus on this little bent pipe. Yes, um, I mean, this is my diagram. I'm not going to go into this diagram because it takes me 40 minutes. But that's, that's the media's diagram, that's my diagram. Because it is, it's a complex process. Um, you create a well for a, a series of operations, you produce for a series of operations, and you have the compressor station, all that happens here. At every stage you have gaseous emissions, water emissions, solid waste emissions, and they all have discrete effects on human health and the environment. But they're not being looked at because we just look at the vent pipe. What you can say is, Gas wells leak. Full stop. Gas wells leak. I don't care what the minister said. The industry's own data. Now this, this paper's on my website. Um, Slumberger is... A, the oil and gas industry is completely liberalised. There is... Yeah, Quadrilla is an office. And it employs lots of other people to actually go and do the work. People to drill, people to service, people to install. Slumberger, one of the big service companies, who actually do the work, and they did a lot of research. This paper's from 2003, and it's of conventional gas wells. 5% um, of conventional gas wells leak on the first day. And that's because when they drill a hole down, the gap between the pipe and the wall of the drill shaft, they plug it with cement. And if that cement job isn't done properly, you get gaps. 
and so the pollutants from deep down can migrate up the side and get to the surface. 5% fail on the first day, half will fail within 25 years. And what's really nice about this, um, if anyone does engineering, uh, Weeble functions, the failure rate of a, of a device. That is a very nice failure rate curve. Uh, and we know this happens. But this is conventional gas. With fracking, you tend to have more than one pipe on the same pad. So you drill number one, and it goes out, and you do your cement job, and you frack it. Then you drill number two, and you do a cement job, and you frack number two, but that will crack the cement on number one. And then you do number three, and that will crack the cement on two and one. And you can have up to 20 wells on one pad. Now, we haven't got any data from the industry because they won't release it, but fracking may produce a higher failure rate because the effect of fracturing the rock deep underground is that it can do damage to cement job. We don't know because they won't release the data. Coal me thing. Um, we have a long history of coal production. And an awful lot of the coal that's quite shallow is worked out, it's gone. But you can only conventionally work coal down to four or five hundred metres. After that, it gets too hot. It's more difficult to pull the coal out. It's more difficult to put fresh air down. And as you go deeper and the coal gets hotter, there's more chance of a spontaneous ignition of the coal and you get more underground fires. That's what happened at Dorman in Warwickshire. It's quite deep, it's quite hot. And without meaning to, just the fact you've got oxygen down there, the coal can start burning. Now, the orange areas, that's down to 1.2 kilometres. Uh, Yorkshire, a lot's been worked out. North Midlands, North Wales, South Wales, Mendips, North East. A lot of that's been worked, but there's still coal that's deeper down they can tap. What they're quite interested in is the green areas, because that's very deep coal, more than 1.2 kilometres. This green bit here goes all the way over to Germany. Um, that they could try and tap, and that is untouched. So there may be more gas down there. Again, because the greater heat at that depth, depth may have created more gas. But any of these areas, they're interested in doing coal with methane. Um, this is another area I've just been visiting the last two months. This is uh, what we call the marshes. So that's Wrexham, Oswestry, Shrewsbury, Crewe, Chester, Warrington. Liverpool up there. Um, that's what they're interested in. These, these squares are what they've already given licenses for. Um, when I'd organised the meeting in Wrexham, a few days later, they put the first application in for test driven just outside Wrexham. And that's going ahead now. Uh, it'll go to the council in the few weeks' time, I think. Uh, these areas here, this is the bit they're consulting on at the moment. Uh, did anybody, people who came to my talk this morning, mm. the picture was taken from just there, looking over here. So that's the bit that they want, they're applying for right now. And if you go to this area, you know, it's picturesque, lovely, <coughs> unspoiled, rolling countryside, but, you know, all these blue areas <coughs> are where the cold is, and that's what they want to get at. Underground coal gasification. It's difficult to politely say how stupid I think this is. Um, I don't like nuclear, but this is worse. I mean, it really is just stupid. One of the things I very often came across in relation to contaminated land was town gas works. Now, from about the 1810s onward, we took coal, we put it in a big steel vessel, heated it up, and it produces gas. And that's what we piped into everybody's homes up until about the 1960s. And, of course, you get the coal, com the gas coming out the top. You have lots of coke left over, which they burn to smoke this fuel. And in the bottom of the, the retort, you had a thick layer of coal tar. And coal tar was the basis of the modern chemicals industry from the 18, early 1800s onwards. And it was wonderful stuff. You got creosote for wood treatment, arsenic, uh, phenols, all sorts of wonderful chemicals, which were the basis of the modern chemical industry. Now, that's in a sealed vessel. And even then, um, I think my favourite is the, the Woolwich Tunnel, where if you go through the Woolwich Tunnel, there's a sort of wall on the shelf. And during the wall, the gas works where the dome is, was hit by a bomb. And it ruptured the tar tanks. And that tar went into the ground. And it's leaking into the Woolwich Tunnel. And every month they have to go along 
they've got a channel down each side and they have to clean the cold tar out. But it's quite toxic stuff. This process is almost the same, but you're doing it in the open environment. You drill two holes, but actually this isn't a very good diagram. You, usually they're lateral, they're lateral, they go down at an angle like that. And then you set fire to the, the coal at the end, and then once that's burned through, you pull back and do it again, and pull back and do it again. And it's called panelling. You take out a panel at a time. And then you move along and do it again. And the idea is, coal heats up. It's not the coal that produces the gas. Some of the <coughs> coal comes from the gas, but it's water. This operates about 900 degrees, so it's actually water hydrolyzing into hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen comes off as hydrogen gas, which is one of the main constituents of the gas that comes off. The oxygen combines with the carbon to produce carbon monoxide, which is the other gas that comes off, which is flammable. Now this stuff is absolutely useless for putting in gas mains, uh, because our gas mains aren't designed to take it. So just about every proposal at the moment is either to feed this to a chemical works, or to have a generating plant at the surface to turn it into electricity. But of course, you're still getting the formation of all these, these pollutants. Phenols, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, plus all the heavy metals which are in the coal already, they're acted upon. And, and the deeper you go, the greater the pressure. And with higher pressure, the more complex the hydrocarbons you'll produce, because that's, that's how chemistry works. And they've done this around the world. The, the idea came up in 1868 from, from William Siemens. It got its real push in the 1920s because Lenin decided that good Russian communists shouldn't go down mines and get killed. And he told his engineers to go and find a way of mining without killing people. So they started doing the first experiments in the Soviet era in the 1930s. Um, the oldest running plant, if you can call it that, it's a very small plant that doesn't really produce a lot. Uh, it's been running from 1961 uh, in Uzbekistan. But the area is actually so polluted by Soviet industry anyway, it's difficult to pick up if it's polluting at all, because the area is already so polluted. We did some experiments in Britain in the 1940s in Derbyshire and gave up. The 1950s, they tried for a couple of years in Worcestershire, North Worcestershire, and there was a parliamentary debate in 1955, because people in Kidderminster were retching with the smell. And after the debate, it all was just shut down and they walked away. Europe has funded some experiments. Uh, my favourite was the one in Spain in 1997. They did it for about two weeks. It's quite deep, 600 metres down. It's one of the deepest to date. And it exploded and sent up a geezer of coal tar. Uh, and they shut it down. 70s, they tried it in Wyoming. And um, this is considered the most wonderful example of, of gasification until you look at the actual reports. There's various reports available on my website. And Hannah especially, uh, after they finished doing tests there, they declared it a Superfund site and had to pump out millions of gallons of water and treat it to stop the pollution moving off site. Majuba in South Africa, that's another small site. It's producing gas for, I think, it's a four or five hundred megawatt power station. Um, and they are continually pumping the water from underneath the site and treating it to stop the pollution moving off site. But there is no monitoring data and they're not saying what the standard of water they're releasing is. So we don't have any independent environment assessment of that. The real big one at the moment is Queensland. The Queensland government went into partnership with three companies uh, beginning of the last decade. And, well, it all, uh, they started seriously gasifying at the end of 2009, beginning of 2010. The first, it first went on at Kingory, where they started getting benzene and toluene in the local water. Uh, Link then had, they were, I think they were forcing salt water from deep down up to the surface, which was getting into the, so they had saline water in the, the local water supply, and then they got the benzene and toluene. Carbon energy, they also had benzene and toluene problems, but they say it was because the farmers were reusing their water when they shouldn't be. But all three have now been shut down. It's wonderful because they actually appointed a scientific panel to independently assess the results as they went along. And they produced a report in 2012 which said, this isn't going well. And that's why they closed down Cougar, Energy, Cougar Energy's plant. And the report which came out earlier this year in June said, we don't think they can decommission. So even though these are very small, they've only gasified a few thousand tons of coal. 
They said, we've got to shut down and make sure that they can remediate before we go any further. And when they did that, Cougar Energy and Link Energy, they've left. They've left Australia. Carbon Energy is making its mind up right now. It doesn't know if it's going to carry on or not. So the moment they were challenged, show that you can do this in a non-polluting way, they left. Link Energy is just applying for a license in Wyoming. And the hearings were a few weeks ago, and completely against the local public opinion, the panel hearing the report decided not to take any evidence on water pollution, which was absurd. And, and this is the problem that a lot of these, you know, are, these companies are going around and they make money because they're pe being paid to do it by investors. And they're leaving pollution behind them. Now, all the trials today, even the ones which have been operating for a long time, they are, they are very small. Um, these are the areas the government has identified in the South Midlands, in Warwickshire and Oxfordshire, where they might want to do this. And quite literally, you would need a hundred of the, tr the trial plants they've run to date. You would need a hundred of them running continuously to replace one average size coal fired power station. So if you're getting a lot of pollution from one tiny plant that's only gasified a few thousand, a one gigawatt coal fired power station burns about 3,000 tonnes of coal a day. Because of the lower efficiency of this process, you'd need to gasify 5,000 tonnes a day. That's a lot of pollution. But unfortunately, nobody's really looking at this. But it is, they are really interested in this because it, it looks, for their point of view, it looks, looks so easy. But it's never gone right to date. And up here, between Coventry, Rugby and Leamington is where Clough Coal have just made the first onshore application for a license to do this. South Wales. Um, this is the South Wales coal field. And again, these are the licenses they've given out. As you can see, down here in the Vale of Morgan, that's fracking for shale gas. Uh, up here in the, in the valleys, this is coal bed methane. And again, I've just done a tour of this area, did, did a few talks around there. And it's interesting that you know, in New South Wales, the government, the state government of New South Wales, is standing against the federal government of Australia to stop them doing carb, uh, coal bed methane in New South Wales. It, it's actually creating quite a constitutional crisis in Australia at the moment because the state government says no and they're in charge. And the new right wing government in Australia says no, you will do this. But what's really interesting is this area here. That's what I talked about earlier, that's clean coal who've who pretty much died a death. That's an area next to Markham Steelworks where the government has said they would like to do underground coal gasification. But this is the Lachar Estuary. When they built Cardiff Bay, uh, they built the, the barrage and walled in the River Taff. Most, going along the coast, the next best wildlife site in Wales is the Lachar Estuary. It's pristine, it has the highest level of wildlife protection you can get in Europe but they've still given the license to do this underneath. And it's bizarre, this is, I, I did a geological section for a, a meeting I did in Swansea a few, a few weeks ago. Um, in geology you have what's called the erogenies, and every few hundred million years, because of plate tectonics, you get plates crashing together and building mountains, and it's called an erogeny. And the Vizian erogeny, 280 million years ago, bent all the strata in this area up on end, and so they're all highly fractured. And down the middle of the Lahar Estuary, there's the Carnarvon Fault. And there's a few other faults as well. And so the area they want to gasify, where the coal seams are, not only has it got an almost direct connection to the surface, which is, you know, benzene and toluene are phytotoxic. They will kill the bacteria at the base of the food chain in the estuary, which supports everything above it. But also, these strata here which are highly fractured and up here they've been mined as well you know this a lot of the pollution is probably going to come up in the middle of the gower so this is a pretty stupid site to do this of all the sites i've looked at where they've given licenses this is the most stupid but if clough coal at the moment clough coal are talking about doing this on their two sites in the firth of fourth and strangely enough five council isn't very keen they're asking for more information. And if that falls through, I think this will be the one that Clough will, will pursue next. Either that or the D estuary, which is equally as bad. Any questions on any of that, because it's sort of technical. 
basically, don't set fire to erogenous zones, you don't know what's going to happen. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, any more technical questions? I've done this, that was the techno speak. I'm now going to get into policy. Don't all leave at once. <laughs> right. Um, when I did my Jam Tomorrow talk, I had a slide where this one is now. And I had written what's on this slide, pretty much. But it was my words. But last November, I replaced it with this because David Cameron said it for me, and a lot better, and a much nicer accent. <laughs> and um, he gave a speech to the CBI, and it didn't get much publicity at the time. But it, 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 was, it was choice stuff. Um, government can still be far too slow at getting stuff done. I'm determined to change this. Here's how. Cutting back on judicial reviews. They've done that. It was enacted in April. Uh, it's much more expensive to do a judicial review now. Um, I know people and friends of the earth and Greenpeace. Greenpeace has withdrawn from one judicial review because they're afraid about the costs. Uh, I know friends of the earth was thinking about doing one in the stopped. Um, it's had a chilling effect on enforcing rights in Britain because it's now so expensive to do judicial review, it's deterring people. They've also cut back on legal aid, so it's more expensive to check the government's decisions, which is a problem because judicial review is there for a reason. It's how the public are able to hold their government to account when they act against the law. And they have deliberately made it difficult so that government will not be held to account when they do things wrongly. So that has been done. Number two. Reducing government consultations. They've done that. Um, when the planning guidance on onshore energy came out in July, it was the first planning guidance in about 15 years not to be consulted on. The last one, curiously, was planning policy guidance 10 back in the 1990s, which I discovered because I went to an Institute Waste Management conference and they thought I was a friend, and they gave me a copy. Um, and I was able to tell everybody and then there was a consultation. But they've introduced it without any consultation, which is a bre breach of the Iron House Convention. Because any policy measure that has serious environmental impacts, there must be a public consultation on, and they haven't done it. So arguably, it's not legal. But of course, apart from writing to the U UN Commission for Europe, which I've done, um, there's no way of, of checking this decision because you can't judicially review them. Streamlining European legislation. Well, the last European, European Heads of Government conference, Cameron was there with his European Red Tape Roadshow. Um, and on this point, Europe is working with Poland, uh, Britain is working with Poland. Because Poland, again, has got a right-wing government that is almost paying companies now to try and do shale gas in Poland. And it's going very badly. Because what they've got out from their test force so far, apparently, is mostly nitrogen. And so it's not economic to do. And they are desperate. It's a whole, it's a whole political bandwagon in Poland because they just want to stuff the Russians. There's no s sound economics or, or, or common sense behind it. It's purely we have to do this to stuff the Russians. And it's not working. Um, the final one, stop, stopping the gold plating legislation at home while well, they're doing that. They're watering down, they're deregulating, they're cutting red tape. My favourite one at the moment, if you can call it that, they're taking the planning functions of all different government agencies in England, so English Heritage, Environment Agency, and they're taking them away from those agencies and merging them into one statutory council team. But of course, yeah, the whole point of going to English Heritage is because they have all the expertise in-house to respond to a plan application. If it's a different agency, they've got to contact English Heritage to get the data. So it doesn't actually save any consultation, but it, what it means is, all statutory council teams will be in one place, so they're more on message. And again, when it comes to um, shale gas, Osborne created the Office for Unconventional Oil and Gas, and it's a very few people who exist somewhere between the Treasury and the Department of Energy. Because it's such a few people, they've been able to control, really control, the information that's been coming out. Now, normally, when responsibilities are divided between different agencies, let's say business and DEC, Department of Energy, then because of inter-departmental rivalries, information will always leak out, so we know what's going on. But with the Office of Unconventional Oil and Gas, it's been wonderful because they've been able to keep everything on message. And it's this last line he said, well, this country is in the economic equivalent of war today, and we need the same spirit. 
We need to forget about crossing every T and dotting every I. We need to throw everything we've got at winning this global race. In war, there are sides, and there are combatants and non-combatants. So what is this war? Because I actually don't know what it is. And who are the combatants, and who are the non-combatants who should be protected? And it, it's, just, it's just rhetoric. It doesn't mean anything. The trouble is that what they're really talking about here is growth. They're talking about we have to get back economic growth because economic growth will save us all, it will make us all feel better, we'll be rich and happy. But again, there's no evidence to demonstrate that. So even the, the proposition here, outside of the rhetoric, is questionable. But this idea that we're in a war, in war anything is justifiable. And this is a problem we have, that they're withdrawing from various forms of public consultation and various forms of accountability ability and transparency in order to get on and do anything at any cost to do this. And that's the bit, more than anything, that the media are not looking at. And nobody, uh, again, I've tried to get people in Friends of the Earth and other groups to look at this, and they don't really want to get into this debate because it's difficult. But this is, about, this is what democracy is all about. It's about transparency, openness, being open to review, and we're doing the opposite right now on, on this one issue. When you think about the issues the government has problems with at the moment, nuclear, GM, whatever, why does this issue get this special treatment? And it really comes down to, you know, politicians are in charge. You know, if it is necessary, if they really do have our best interests in heart, then well, perhaps they should grab us by the scruff and neck and pull us. But they still have to justify why. And so it all comes down to who is advising these people. Let me see that diagram. I did that back in May, and it's caused me untold grief. <laughs> I had so much hassle about this diagram. It's what I call the fractogram. And it takes me an hour to go through every little link on there and explain why the link exists. Everything from the British Institute for Energy Economics and Lawson and Climate Nice, but I'm just going to talk about this little virtuous cycle here. Uh, David Cameron has a special energy advisor. You've all heard of special advisors. Um, special advisors really started under John Major. Labour made a whole profession out of being special advisors. And under the current coalition government, we've got duplicate special advisors because the Lib Dems have to have them as well as the as well as Conservatives. Um, ben Moxon was until 20, uh, till May this year David Cameron's energy advisor. He's the Vice President of Riverstone, which is one of the world's big energy investment houses. Managing Director of Riverstone is Lord Brown, who is a non-executive director of the Cabinet Office, who is you know, filtering his expertise into government departments. So you know, it was one of his chums, I can't remember the name of the company, it's a company that runs three gas power power stations. One of his chums, who he parachuted into the Department of Energy, is writing the rules on subsidising new gas oil power stations at the moment. So there's somebody who works for a power company writing the rules for how they're going to give them money. Uh, anyway, Ben Moxon. Riverstone was one of the major investors in Quadrilla, who are Britain's most vocal driller. And so the man who's advising David Cameron on what we should do has a vested interest in making sure Quadrilla can do it. But that's okay, because he finished in May of this year and Tara Singh came in. She's a former energy lobbyist for Centrica. And two weeks after she got her job, Centrica bought a 16% stake in Quadrilla. But Centrica also have a stake in Dart Energy, who are drilling in that, the, the, the site at Wrexham they've just applied for. That's Dart. They've just put some applications in near York. And they are one of the people who are trying to do the exploratory drilling in South Wales as well. So. It would seem that one of the major qualifications to be David Cameron's energy advisor is that your corporate alma mater must be drilling for shale gas. Now, that's a bit dodgy, isn't it? Um, Dart is an Australian company. Uh, Quadrilla uh, was originally whole, run by a company called AJ Lucas, who are also an Australian company. But AJ Lucas had financial problems, so that's where Riverstone came in. But most uh, Eden Energy, who are just selling up 
to another company who we know little about called Shared Energy PLC. You know, they're another Australian company because Australia has all the expertise on coal burnt methane. They are represented in Australia by the Australian Petroleum Production and Exploration Association, whose principal lobbyists are Crosby Texter. And Crosby Texter's co founder is Linton Crosby, who's David Cameron's principal special advisor, particularly on election strategy. Now, there is a certain degree of six degrees of separation in this. Yes, they might just know each other. But you have to say there is a pattern. And it's not open, it's not transparent, and it is embodying vested interests. There is a word for this. There's, there's a, a, a legal offence created in the Victorian era called malfeasance in public office. And malfeasance isn't corruption, it's not fraud. Basically, it's taking a decision which has been subject to undue influence and is not in the public interest. Or another way of looking at it in one of the most recent decisions, um, it's taking a decision which is unreasonable because no other person could have reasonably made it. And this is malfeasance in public office. And this is the last thing we have left to get them with. And this is my little project at the moment. Um, I'm checking every factoid I have. And I've almost finished. The trouble is, it's taking me six weeks to get, to get a single question answered at the moment. So I wanted to do this now. I wanted to do this in December, but it looks like it's going to be April at the moment. But I'm going to put this together as a report, detailing all this. That's where this diagram came from back in May. This is my plan for how I'm going to, this is my structure for how I'm going to check all the facts and put it into a report and send it to my MP, basically saying, will you please do your government? And he's going to say no. We have bad history anyway. Um, and then I'm going to have to send it to the Director of Public Prosecutions and various other people. And what I want to do, if they all say no, that's great, because malfeasance is an indictable offence. And any indictable offence, if no other person in authority will take action, is citizens arrestable. The Police and Criminal Evidence Act mm -hmm. allows a citizen to make a citizen's arrest for an indictable offence if no other person in authority will do so. So I want to turn up at Downing Street when the cabinet meeting is in session and arrest them all. Because I think this is the only way we're going to get the media to seriously look at all this data. And it is, it's sort of like a circus that you know, we shouldn't have to go to these lengths to get discussions about serious issues which are backed up by an awful lot of peer-reviewed science, government-funded research, government agency research from a number of countries now, Canada, Australia, America, we shouldn't have to do this, but this is what it's come to, because they are, they are withdrawing so much from an open and transparent debate that we're left with few other options. I'm going to finish um, by looking at British Geological Survey's assessment of the Bowdoin Shale. Um, when this came out in May, the Daily Mail practically wet itself, um, because we had 400 years of gas in the Berlin show. And it was bizarre. I mean, everybody just swallowed this factoid. Nobody challenged it. Now, you can challenge this with A-level geology. What you learn in A-level geology about the difference between a reserve and a resource, you can challenge that figure and take it apart. And nobody did. Obviously, journalists don't do A-level geology, uh, ge geography. This is what's called the gas in place figure. That's how much gas is physically in the rock. More importantly, it's what's called a probabilistic assessment. So, what's the probability that one cubic metre of gas exists? Well, that's about 100%. What's the probability that a thousand exist? 99%. And literally, you do that. You look at the probability that a certain volume of gas exists in the rock. And you draw a little curve, which represents the probability of a certain amount. And then you look at various figures of probability. Now, this figure is what's called the P50. There's a 50-50 chance that that figure exists. Okay? So if we, if we knock off... Now, if you, if you went to the stock exchange, if I was a company investing, and I went to the stock exchange with a P50 figure 
they will do me. Because you are not allowed to report P50 figures as if they're real, because they're considered too unreliable. They require the P90, the 90% figure, to report on your returns to the stock exchange. And if you drop at the P90, it's instantly nearly 40% less than that headline figure. But that's okay, you know, it's still 23.3 trillion cubic meters. It, it's quite a lot of gas. Right. Okay, we now got the P90 of gas in place, but it takes 30 or 40 years at least, it could take 100 years to produce that gas. So you have to divide this figure by your production period. So let's, I think for these figures I took 35, because it's sort of 30, 30 or 40 is the quickest we'll be able to do it without it becoming completely uneconomic. Well, okay, per year, that's still 7.4 times our current annual gas consumption. So that is still a lot of gas. Okay. That is still the gas in place figure. In the North Sea, 70% of all the oil in the North Sea will still be there when we've finished extracting oil, because you can't get it all out. At best, you'll get 30-35% of oil from the North Sea. With gas, shale gas, it's about 2 to 10%. 2% is a rough average, 10% is if you're really lucky, if you strike one of those hot spots. So that's somewhere between 15% to, to 3 quarters of annual gas use we will finally produce per year. So all of a sudden, from that headline figure, on an annualised basis, nearly 99% of all the gas they said was there isn't going to be produced on an annual basis. But of course, uh, this area, if I go back a few slides, blah, blah, blah. this area, um, the green is the lower burden shale, the orange is the upper burden shale, and the purple is where you have both layers. So obviously the purple is the area you really want to go after to get the shale gas out just happens to be one of the most densely populated parts of northern England. Manchester, Liverpool, Warrington, going up here to Blackpool, Leeds. Probably the best place they could do it will be up here, but that's, that's North Yorkshire National Park. So if you knock off the urban areas, you lose even more. And what you end up with is we might, at best, assuming we get a good percentage, and assuming we do it in 35 years, not 100, we might get 11 to 55% of our annual gas use. If it was 80 years, it's going to be half of that. So it, it doesn't do what it says in the tin, basically. The gas they say is there isn't there. It's either not going to be produced, or when you look at how we have to produce it, we're not going to get that much on an annual basis. So it doesn't make that much difference. Now, each year at the moment, we're losing about 15% of production from the North Sea. That's gas. This doesn't produce oil. We still need to import oil because the North Sea oil is still going down. But even at best, this is not going to stop. It's not going to arrest the decline of the North Sea production. So we're still going to be importing more gas. It makes very little difference, which is why, uh, last week, even Lord Brown had to say, that he doesn't think it's going to reduce gas prices in Britain. And yet this is one of the major selling points of this technology. It's going to reduce gas prices like it did in America. But if you look at the figures in America, it hasn't reduced gas prices. If you plot the rise of shale gas production and you look at figures for gas prices in America, what you can correlate it to is the recession. Gas prices in America fell due to demand destruction, not due to shale gas production. And what's really interesting, if you look at the number of drilling rigs in America, uh, around 2000 there were 300 or so gas drilling rigs in America. And all that money from Wall Street, all that funny investment money during the 2000s, went in. And by 2008, you had 1600 gas drilling rigs in America. And after the crash, the number of drilling rigs did that. So we've had, it took four years between when they started drilling in 2000 for the gas production to pick up. We've had four years since the 2008 crash when the drilling rigs disappeared. And this year, on the last set of data, gas shale gas production in America has started to fall away. And what's really interesting is the US Energy Information Agency, which is a body charged by Congress to impartially report energy statistics in America. Their last report in April 
It said that gas prices in America are likely to double in the next 20 years. Because A, um, shale gas costs more to produce. But B, what they want to do with shale gas is export it. Because they can get $8 a billion cubic feet in America, they can get twice that amount in Europe and three times that amount in Asia. Now, this is what, exactly what happened in Australia. Australia had fairly cheap gas because it's an isolated economy for gas purposes. The moment they built a liquefaction plant and started exporting it off to Japan, all of a sudden, Australian gas prices have to compete with Japanese gas prices, which are way higher than Australia's, because they can get a better price by putting it onto a ship and sending it to Japan. And that's what's happened. In Australia, gas prices have started to rise as they've had to compete with ex exporting it. So basically, what they promised was going to be there, and this was launched with much government fanfare back in May, is never going to be produced. And what's even more interesting is the good, impartial scientists of the British Geological Survey, you really have to press them to admit any of this. They won't openly discuss this. Um, and it, and it's, it's a big issue. The British Geological Survey is not an impartial institute. They are paid... They make their money by selling their expertise to the people who are doing the work. They're not an impartial player in this. And so when they come out with these figures, um, you have to question them. I'm not saying that they're wrong. The, the, the methodology is absolutely valid that they've done to produce this figure. But you have to question what it means. And that isn't being done, certainly not by the media, and certainly not by a lot of the campaign groups who represent the public interest. And I don't know why, but they're not doing it. Anyway... To conclude, in that best, best Python-esque phrase, what will extreme energy do for us? Um, energy security, no. It, we are not going to arrest the decline in the North Sea. Because once you've reached the peak and you start to decline, it will carry on until it runs out. Which is probably another 15 or 20 years. And even if we went at this hammer and tongs to build up coal bed methane and shale gas in Britain, we're not going to catch up with that. And even if we could catch up with the decline rate, we're never going to produce as much gas each year as the North Sea was providing for us. So we're still going to be importing gas from Russia. We're going to be importing it by ship from Algeria and Qatar in liquefied form. Prices, no, it won't lead to lower prices because we work in a globalised market. Even if we could get cheap, lots and lots of cheap shale gas in Britain, the pipelines that currently go from Russia to Britain across the North Sea, they can work in both directions. So it might be that the operators here decide <coughs> they can sell it back to Germany and get a better price than we're paying they could get for it here. And they might do that, which would mean British prices would, would have to balance with the European, European, European price there. So it doesn't mean lower domestic gas prices. So ultimately, the economy is not going to save the economy because the idea that the economy works by lots and lots of cheap energy, absolutely true. But this isn't going to give us that. It will give us the opposite. It's going to be more expensive because the process itself is more expensive and we'll still be importing gas from around the world and gas prices around the world are still going to rise because we're running out of the good stuff. Now, this sort of came home to me a few weeks ago when they announced the contract for Hinkley C nuclear power station. And everybody was up in arms because, oh, no, 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 They're, we've agreed twice the current electricity price for Hinkley C. Now, what I was talking about earlier about exponential trends, about doubling time. If the electricity prices in this country are rising, except for the electricity you know, across the country, 7% rise every year. If you do that for 10 years, it doubles in price. And so all the government has admitted in the signing of the Hinkley Sea contract is that they expect electricity prices in this country to be double what they are today in 10 years' time. Which to me doesn't say that they believe that any of this is going to work. And ultimately, our economy can't take that. There comes a point, especially Britain, because I mean, one of the reasons so many people from across Europe come to Britain is because our wages are so high by comparison to the rest of Europe. And the reason our wages are high is because we have some of the most expensive housing in Europe. And we have some of the most expensive energy prices in Europe. And that's really what North Sea has done for us. Yeah, North Sea 
has created an asset price boom in Britain. Because all that money flowing in from the 80s over the 90s has allowed our economy, all the prices, to boom up. And now we've gone over that hump and we're on the way out of the North Sea. We literally can't afford our house prices as they currently are. Our economy cannot support that. And that's not my view. Even the OECD has said that for the last... Every year the OECD does a health check on the British economy. And the last week it is three or four years. They've said that our house prices are far too high, that they cannot be supported by the economies it currently is. And yet, is any politician seriously advocating reducing house prices? No. What they're doing is doing anything possible to try and bump house prices up even further. And so loading onto the top of that higher energy prices, because that's what's inevitably going to happen, and we're not going to get an economic recovery because people won't consume. They will have nothing to spend their money on except for housing and energy. There won't be, if any at all, uh, discretionary spending because it will all be taken up in food, housing and energy bills. And that is why, I mean, um, uh, what's his name, Bowker's book? Oh, The Jilted Generation, which looks at the economic trends and what they mean for the current 20-somethings. Yeah, they are going to be the first generation in about 100 odd years in this country who are going to be worse off than their parents. And that is unavoidable, purely because of that boom that happened from the, the 80s onwards. Interestingly, the current generation of retirees, the baby boomers, they bought their houses in the 60s and early 70s. And the inf hyperinflation of the late 70s devalued the value of their mortgage, which meant they all paid off their mortgages and they're sitting on houses. But they're not rich, because all they can do is trade in their house and live in a tent. Because even if you trade in your house, you still have to buy another house. So you're no better off. And this is the thing about house prices, it's a really cat handy way of making people rich. Because really you're not. Because everybody's house price goes up roughly the same. So, the same slide I finished with this morning. <laughs> um, <sighs> It's really difficult that there are so many good researchers, there are so many um, good academics doing really good integrative work, not just in social sciences, not just in economics, but even in uh, toxicology. Some of the, the work that's come out of Australia recently on the toxicology related to Colbert methane is wonderful. Um, they recently discovered that uh, chlorohal... Um, Oh, come on. Chlorofluorocarbons. The stuff we ban because it was eating the ozone layer. Because they're using chlorine-based compounds to do coal bed methane in, a, in Australia, they're emitting chlorinated hydrocarbons, which are depleting ozone. I mean, there's all sorts of wonderful stuff coming out. Um, in America, particularly, uh, Canada especially, Canada has had a big debate, which has been led by the First Nations. And they're having a wonderful debate in Canada. It's a real ding-dong between the federal government who want this, the state's governments who aren't very happy, apart from um, uh, the, the Athabasca area, where the, the tar sands are. Um, but it's all for nothing. Because we don't have an open and transparent system of government anymore that values learned experience and input. Anything but, they will, they will have their experts they're not going to consult, and that's not a way to run a country. If you do that, people are going to get angry, and they're going to get annoyed. And in America, um, in Australia, you've got the Lock the Gate Coalition. I mean, one of the reasons that Dart Energy, who are drilling up in Wrexham, York, South Wales, they officially left Australia in April. They announced in the Australian... We're going to Britain because they understand us. They're not requiring all these unreasonable measures. And all that the New South Wales government wanted was an environmental impact assessment and a buffer zone around communities so they wouldn't be drilling underneath communities. That's all they wanted. And that was not good enough. So they're coming to Britain where we don't require those things. And it's absurd. And again, the media could have picked up on that, but they haven't. So, that's it. Um, any questions? More of a comment. Sorry, do you want to go first? Okay. No, it's just, um, just to say that um, what you were talking about with the legislation here happened in Canada last year. 
with the C45 and C38 legislation where all of the environmental regulation protections were stripped. And it was basically just, it was blatantly just removing every last obstacle that there was to drilling there. So it seems to be happening everywhere now. But now you've got the First Nations who are obstructing the roads. Yeah, they're getting uh, shot at as well. Yeah, I mean it is, <laughs> It's like wounded knee in America. Yeah. It really, it's become a, a big issue for the First Nations, particularly because they've been disturbing some of their, their ancient sites. Well, the courts just ruled in favor of the companies in New Brunswick because they had been blockading a couple of weeks ago, and then it was taken to court, and the court sided with the companies and said they're not allowed. To, they still are, but the court said they're not allowed. Mm. So basically, not only are the police protecting the companies now, but the courts are protecting mm. the companies. But of course, courts can only rule on what the law says. Mm. And if the law has been fixed, then the court can only come down one way. <clears throat> yeah, um, a couple of questions. The first question was, um, from a kind of a political economic point of view, do you think, what, what are the causes of the rise of energy prices in your mind? Are they purely just is it just purely a supply and demand issue the fact that we are re reaching the, the limits of finite fossil fuels or are there other forces uh, involved in the mix um <laughs> that's the first that. question <laughs> um talking about oil or gas um well, oh, oh. see every in. every fuel has its own market oil is the most mobile market oil is really user friendly you can pump it out of the ground put it in barrels or on a ship and just move it to whoever will pay the biggest price. Gas is more difficult because you have to pipe it or liquefy it. And if you liquefy it, you lose up to 60% of your gas. But that also means you get a better price for it. Um, in Europe, the causes of high prices are purely lack of supply. Since not, well, the British North Sea sector uh, peaked oil in 1999, gas in 2003. The Norwegian sector peaked a couple of years later. Mm. And even Russia, um, I, I did some work with the British Council. Um, oh, that's a few years ago now. And I was doing a, a, a video stream to a, a university in Siberia, near Irkutsk. And everybody was sat with big heavy coats and hats on because they were rationing gas supply to Siberia because they can get more money for it by pumping it to Europe. So even in Russia, there's issues about a very resource-rich country, even doing, to some extent, internal rationing, because they can get far more money for it by sending it to Europe. But Russia might get to peak gas in 10 or 15 years, and then all we have left then is liquefied gas, which is more expensive, because it's far more expensive to, to produce, because you lose so much. Um, most of the liquefaction plants at the moment are being built in the Middle East and North Africa. And... The problem there is that if you have a ship with gas on, it can go anywhere. It can go to Japan, and they'll pay far more than we're prepared to pay. It can go to North America, and they will not pay as much, but if they're desperate, they will pay more than us. So we're then in a global market, just like oil, in which case the whole isolation of the regional markets disappears and we're paying international prices. The bigger issue in Europe is infrastructure. That but this is the interesting thing about Hinkley C. Um, there is an issue as to whether, if it runs for 50 years, there will be any uranium for it at the end of its life. Because the uranium has supply problems right now. Uh, the, the nuclear industry for the last 15, 20 years has been running on military uranium that they stockpiled during the 60s and 70s, 1960s, 1970s, and then had no use for after the end of the Cold War, and they were selling off cheap. Well, the, what happened then was, a lot of uranium mines around the world closed or were never built. And now they're chasing, and most of the best uranium resources are gone. So even nuclear power has got huge capacity problems 20 or 30 years down the line. Oil, there's a bit of issue about oil figures, but we've probably peaked with oil. Uh, it's been on a plateau since 2003. The recent upswing, if you look at the, oh, sorry, that way around, uh, the recent upswing in global oil production most of that is biofuel and shale oil. It's not conventional oil. And even with the best will in the world, um, shale oil and biofuels aren't going to be more than 10 or 
of global conventional oil. So once we get the downturn in oil supply, which would happen in two or three years' time, on some estimates, then we're in a whole different world. So it, it, there's no one answer on this. Speculation, to some extent. Price fixing, to some extent. Mm. Infrastructure is a big issue, <clears throat> and that has an issue for how much we're going to be paying in, let's say, 10 years' time. And this is a problem, that if you can... Uh, last December, when we were sort of six hours from starting to cut people off, as it was put in the Daily Mail, the Isle of Grain gas terminal still had a lot of gas in it, but they didn't report it. Because, of course, the gas price went up and they got more for it. So that is a definite market fix. But in the long term, market fixes don't mean anything because we're just running out. Just one quick follow-up question. Um, and do you not think that with, with this, the inevitable rise in, in energy prices, this be could become prohibitive? for the, the entire economy, for production, uh, it could have a destabilizing effect. Uh, and do you, when, you, when you say we need to retool the economy, how do you envisage this and can it be done within the strictures, the framework of you know, the market we have economy? To, we have to bin neoclassical economics and place it with ecological economics. Mm. And that is a very different world from anything that current politicians are used to. And in the long term, you have to address consumption. And no, we've had 50 years of politicians promising more. I mean, this really, this was Keynes's Faustian pact back in the 1930s. He decided that as long as you can promise everybody more each year, then they will no longer question the allocation of who gets what. And guess what? It worked. You know, Keynes's pact worked. And for 50 years, you know, as long as everybody's got a little bit more each year, all, those, all that strife of the... 1920s and 30s has gone. But of course, now that can't continue. Um, and in this country, the bottom 20% of their income started to fall at the end of the 80s, the early 90s, mainly because they were being pushed onto benefits. But they don't matter. So that was ignored. In the 1990s recessions, that contraction started to spread into the second quintile. And now we're in the middle quintile with the current austerity issue. All of a sudden, it's news that, oh, hang on, our incomes aren't going up anymore. Now, that isn't going to stop anytime soon, in part because the government has no way of delivering cheaper fuel. And we've had cheaper fuel and cheaper housing costs. On laying on the back of that, cheap, uh, more expensive fuel is pushing up food prices year on year. That's before we even get to serious climate change impacts. Um, people just won't afford it. And there's this issue that, you know, well, to what extent are energy prices elastic? How much can people stretch? And Jan James Hamilton, uh, wrote a paper for the Brookings Institute in 2009 where he looked at what was the root cause of the 2008 crash and they blamed it on subprime mortgages. What he was looking at was what were the people who had those mortgages doing and they had a choice in 2007. Do I put fuel in the car, buy food or pay the mortgage? And they didn't pay the mortgage because it wasn't an immediate issue. If they wanted to keep their job they had to put fuel in the car. If they wanted to eat they had to buy the food Paying the mortgage was the last thing on their mind. And so the real initiator of the 2007-2008 economic crisis was the high energy prices, high food prices, which had a knock-on effect on household budgets. And that isn't going to stop. And at the moment, you know, we, there is no foreseeable end to the continually rising price of energy. And the current fiddling that they're doing, getting rid of the green measures to save 50 quid in a one-off saving, what happens next year? What are they going to cut next year? There is nothing more. This is a general commentary. Um, so I'm thinking about the unwillingness of politicians to acknowledge the science is mirrored by the unwillingness of the individual to do the same. Yeah. And the analysis of the individual's response to this is frequently lacking. I don't hear too much about it. And that reminds me of the catastrophe that happened in Ireland around the banking yeah. crisis. Yeah. We're all thrilled and delighted to blame the bankers, which is endlessly what I hear from the taxi drivers in Dublin when I go back, about how the politicians <coughs> ruined us and the bankers ruined us. 
But the individual is completely absent. They never take responsibility for the fact that they were the ones who went in and took out the loans. Mm. The comment you made about <clears throat> the language that David Cameron uses, I've noticed that myself as well. Mm. He uses that warlike language about all kinds of topics. Like he's in China at the moment and it's all full of making Britain great. And <laughs> I just he's, in, he's in China selling pig semen. But, but, I mean, what is interesting about it is that the Chinese told him that he belongs to a little country and they're not really interested. Whereas, whereas he portrays it is that the Chinese are going to save Britain. You know, they're going to build nuclear power stations, they're going to do what is it, QE2 or Q2, whatever it's called. And why is he doing this? I think he's doing it because he actually, I think, knows, because he's not stupid. He knows fracking is not going to work. Know. Yeah. He knows this. So why is he doing it? Why does he use that language? Because politically, it is part of, it's consonant with all the rest of the rhetoric about he's doing great for Britain and it's all going to be wonderful, and things are getting better. And it's not the first time that politicians haven't acknowledged reality. I mean, history, I think, is like when you say, I'm not sure I'd agree with you when you say that it's only in the last while that this is happening, that they ignore science. Politicians have ignored truth it's forever. The, it's the extent to which, I mean, it's... But at least before they could find somebody who impartially could produce mm. some... It's this, it, this issue that's been around since the 50s. As long as you can find some shred of doubt, there's a debate, and there is a, therefore uncertainty. But, he, but they can't even find that now. But Paul, we had yeah. a famine in Ireland, and they had one million people died in the space of about four years. Mm. And they all knew about it over here. Mm -hmm. And the politicians knew about it but over here. What? And they didn't do anything about it. Why? Because of ideology. Yes. But it's, it's about that whole, isn't it, about that whole colonial empire myth, which is all down to resources anyway. Yeah. And it's what made the empire great. So the whole rhetoric is designed around that, as in sort of, we're still brilliant and we can do it. And we're never going to admit that we're running out of resources. But like I don't know said. why. It's interesting. Quite a lot of Irish people raised potato for me. <laughs> and only 16% died. That's huge. In, 16, in the 1650s, 40% died as a result of Cromwell. Well, yes, I know that. <laughs> but 16%, 16 Paul, of 8 million at the yes. time, and now it's 3 and 3 quarter million. Yeah. Half of the people either died or left the country. And that is what's happening again. You yeah. know, you've had an exodus of people from Ireland in the yeah. last three years. Mm. Yeah. And in Britain, it's really interesting that um, there, there is a willing... I mean, I speak to... I mean, I don't do big meetings. The biggest meetings I do are two, 200 people. And I, I much prefer to things like this. And for the last two months, I've been going around doing meetings of no more than 90, 100. Um, but mostly averaging around 30. And it's better, I like that. But I speak to about 5,000 people a year doing that. And because it's pretty much one-to-one, -one, I would say that most people get this. Although, I, mean, I went back to here, because although there is this sort of miasma of spin that pervades the media these days, most people can see through that. But when they go home and do the sums of what's left of their lives after their working week, they just choose that well, actually, no, I'm just going to go along with it. Mm. And what could I do anyway? Mm. And that is, for me, the bigger issue. It's the, it's the, the belief that nothing can change, which is far well, more damaging to democracy. I, I just, in detail, read a, um, a study that was done by uh, National Ge Ge Geographic, and they looked at 17 countries, uh, both developed and developing countries, and one of the questions, were two particular interesting questions they asked, among a whole plethora of questions, but one of them was, um, uh, do you feel, uh, do you feel able to control the damage that's been done to the environment? And people in developing countries said they didn't. People in developed countries said they did feel that they could control it. But the other interesting question that they were asked was, do you feel guilty about what's happening? 
developed countries, no guilt. Developing, loads of guilt. So in other words, people in developing countries don't feel guilty about what's happening, even though they know they could do something about it. Could it's an arrogance, isn't it? Huh? It's the sort of yeah. arrogance that comes with a yeah, weird developed society, kind of, we brought this... Stands back and then people are like... Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. And about how they're like not willing to admit that, mm. you know, it's a failure to kind of get to the point where we are where we have arrived today and it, and it hasn't been beneficial for mankind. Okay. I think it's important to, to recognise as well that the, the, the vast majority of those responsible for, for example, CO2 emissions, on as citizens, as, as individuals, uh, it's, it's institutional players. It's, it's the extractive industries, it's the, the manufacturers, they're, they're responsible for the lion's share. So in fact, in a way, we shouldn't necessarily as individuals feel um, responsible in the same way that the key institutional strategic players should do. So I, I, think, I think it's not entirely, uh, I, think it's not, I think it's a bit misleading to say that you know, we, we are all equally responsible, because that's, that's the predicate of what you were, you're associated Yes, indeed, because the people who and work in... We're not equally well, I think they are, because the people who work in those institutions are in, in individuals. Sure, sure, but are we, are, are we as equally responsible as the, as the CEOs of, of BP and Shell and Esso? They're all people. We swallow yeah. them, right? But that assumes that you can but, do nothing. But yeah. to, 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 to reduce it to us as individuals, then just conceals the systemic structural nature of this. And that's what we need to focus on. And just to go briefly back to what you said about people in Ireland, I think, I think it's not fair to say you know, that, that people should have known and they shouldn't have been taking out these loans because you know, in the West, wages have been declining and sort of stagnating for the last 40 <coughs> years. So there's a reason people have been taking out loans. Because they're, they're trying to make no, ends meet. No, that's not yeah, true. That it is isn't true. true. Because the people in Ireland who took out those loans, I'm not blaming, blaming the individual. It, it wasn't just them. It was banks pumping okay. in money, mm, mm, se sure. seducing people yeah. into doing it. But the people were speculating. That's the whole thing. That, that was the problem. People, I saw it. There people was a were buying and selling. If you look at Britain's total credit debt, about a fifth of it is government. About a fifth of it is public, people. Three fifths of it is corporations. Mm. All those companies on the London Stock Exchange, all those leverage take out, t their takeovers in the 90s and 2000s. You know, companies have accrued far more debt than people. Now, do we get to the stage where companies are too big to fail and we have to bail out the companies? Mm. Mm. We're at that stage. <laughs> that's that's now, yeah, that's there is a big is. issue that what if we hadn't bailed out the banks? What would have happened? Iceland? You need to have Iceland. Yeah, Iceland has had a revolution. And they've had a wholesale turnover in their, in their politics because they didn't bail out the banks because the people basically said no. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't collapsed. It's got better, if anything. And this is what's interesting about <coughs> things like housing debt that what if we have another big, big crisis, which could happen. I mean, at the moment, as a, back in September 2008, I stood in this hall in Scamster and said, what will happen to Lehman Brothers next week? Because it was obvious, to me anyway. And that was credit default swaps. That's the reinsurance of loans if they go bad. That wasn't the loans themselves going bad. What is currently on the edge of teetering is the bond market. Now, that is mostly corporate and government debt. And it's, the re it's not the reinsurance, it's the actual value of the debt itself. Now, all that's propping up the global economy right now is quantitative easing. Most of America's growth is the $50 billion a month that the uh, Reserve Bank of America is making available cheap. Um, in Britain, it's the was it ten billion dollar, uh, ten billion pounds a month that, go, uh, that they're, they're creating from the Bank of England. Now, of course, if you're creating free, cheap money, you just give away to banks. You don't get high interest rates because money is worth it. <coughs> so, pension <coughs> funds at the moment are facing a crisis, and we've gone from having a one to two year deficit of pension fund payments about five or six years ago before the crisis because of low interest rates the last three or four years. 
we're now up to seven or eight years deficit in pension funds. And if low interest rates carry on for another year or two, many pension funds will start to go broke because they won't be able to pay out their immediate liabilities because they're not earning enough from their investments. Uh, what you are getting, that's partly why we have all this boom of stupid ideas, because the money is chasing any possible investment opportunity which mm. might, might produce a return more than half a percent. And that's why Cameron speaks the way he does. Yes. It's all wonderful. But you know, it, even if the bond market doesn't go, when the pension funds start to fall over in about a year or 18, 18 months' time, yeah, that is very serious for the whole structure of society. But in the longer term, if we don't grow, then not only can we not pay back the debt, but there won't be pensions in the future. Not private pensions, anyway. And that's a much bigger issue for a, a particular aging society as to how we pay for things in the future. And it's all out there. The, the research is out there. The, the conference papers and proceedings are out there, which go into all of this. It's just not talked about. And I, 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 I sometimes wish I didn't spend my time reading all this stuff, because... It doesn't make a lot of money for me to go around talking about it. <laughs> okay, we'll have one more question then. Okay, I'm just going to say, if, if you accept that, that capitalism is predicated on, on growth, because of, of the need to accumulate capital, uh, but we, ecologically speaking, understand that there are limits to growth, uh, mm -hmm. you know, planetary boundaries, there are many, not just uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but the nitrogen cycle, mm -hmm. you know, habitat destruction, all these things. Um, so how do we get around that? Less. How, how do we stop? We just have less. But if it's, if even, it's even, even growth, Adam Smith himself growth. didn't believe in endless growth. He believed the economy will grow to a point and then stop. And we've only believed in endless growth since the late 30s, early 40s. And J.K. Galbraith, who wrote most of his work in the 50s and 60s, he was extremely sceptical of that back then. And I mean, this is the point. This isn't new. Uh, you had J.K. Galbraith, 50s, 60s. You had Kenneth Balding, uh, 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, Nicholas Georgescu Rogan. I mean, his, his book, um, Entropy and the Economic Process, came out in 1971. It's 50 years ahead of its time. You look at what he was doing. It's brilliant. I mean, he was doing all the mathematical economics of what we, where this is all going. And he was ignored until about the last five years. And even now, he's treated with a pinch of salt. So, people have been looking at this for a long time. The trouble is, when capitalism came around, well, A, uh, Adam Smith was, had morality at the beginning of the process. So you wouldn't have done what we've done now. You would never, ever have had a, a system working on credit, which has only really existed since the 1920s. But most importantly, Adam Smith believed that we would grow to a point and then stop. And limitless growth, again, is a very recent, recent feature that's only been around since about the 1930s. So I don't think we're living in capitalism. I don't think that the economics of today has, have anything to do with what we call, what, we, what Marx has identified as capitalism. But actually, most of those theories, capitalism, Marxism, they're irrelevant because they were written in a time when we didn't have limits. And the future of limits, you can have right-wing and left-wing responses to that. You can have, we are just going to go and grab it, which unfortunately is what we're doing right now with the land grabs in Africa, you know, the, the failure to act on really damaging mining in developing countries, illegal mining, and the complicity of the markets in buying the produce of those illegal mining operations. You know, we needn't have that. The trouble is, if you do that, then you don't get the vast accumulation of wealth, which is what the people who now run the world want to have. And that's what it's really about when it comes down to it. It's not about greed, it's about control. And it's about those people who want to do something different, finding a way of having control in their lives that takes them through this process. And that could be, um, going back to the land, as some of the people fought in the 70s, some people have done interesting ways that do that, you're getting urban permaculture now. Lots of people finding ways to live outside the system in urban environments. You're getting um, alternative economies, local currencies. There are a whole load of different things across the spectrum that are reactive to this. But unless you get the public debate with that, 
across the media instead of this babble, it's never going to amount to anything because nobody will know it exists. And that is the bigger issue, really. We have to have the public debate because unless you have a consensus, you'll never get the quality of change required. It will always be imposed. And when, when anything is opposed, people will say no in general. I mean, I would. If anything was imposed on me, I would just say no. Mm. Out of principle. Okay. We're about to be, um, well, I think the room will be closing around about nine anyway. Can I just ask you, Paul, just to, just to um, elaborate a little bit more on, on the point you made this morning about the consumption levels of the 1950s as possibly something we need to go back to? Right. Um, since the 1950s, we have become about four times more efficient. Okay? Since the 1950s in this country, we've doubled energy consumption and resource consumption. More than so if you look at a doubling of consumption and then go back halfway, and then you divide that by four because of increased efficiency four times, it looks like the 1950s, which is about 30 or 40% of what we're using now. So you can have a sort of 1950s level of service in terms of goods. You know, a washing machine bought in the 1950s would, would be running 20 years later. You buy one now, and you can only get a three-year guarantee on it because they don't want it to run after them. Yeah, we're talking about increasing the longevity of goods, making them serviceable, repairable. So it doesn't mean you won't have washing machines, you won't have a computer. It's just they will have to last longer, they will have to be repairable, serviceable. And the thing about a lot of technology is most of the energy consumption is in manufacturing, it's not in use. And so if we can seriously deal with how our tools are made. And finally, of course, yes, there will have to be less stuff, but 90 odd percent of what we buy, we don't have it in our possession six months later. It's gone, it's in the rubbish. So there's an awful lot of savings we can make just by you know, not getting. I mean, uh, plastic packaging is such a good example of the whole problem with society, not just because it's there, but because the last five years, the data that's come out on nanoparticles of plastic in the oceans and the damage they're doing to the world's oceans, you would think there would be mass action, a bit like the action around the ozone layer. The thing is that the whole um, Montreal Protocol, all the patents are about to expire on those chemicals anyway, so they're quite happy to stop using them. But they're not happy to stop using plastic because it's the core of what so much of industry and, and retail does. So it's doable. I think it's easily doable. But it requires that people have a different view of themselves. Of that actually, you know, I'm not going to buy that because I'm worth it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on that note, I think we should all thank Paul for a very stimulating talk.